it, now it is my distinct honor and privilege to, to introduce you to tonight's speaker. We have a special guest in our very own author and board member, Randy Houghton. Tonight, Randy will be speaking about his Vietnam maritime patrol operations during the war, specifically focusing on Operation Market Time. He will be providing, uh, able to provide an up-close and personal look at the aircraft, equipment, and strategy used during that time. So please help me at this time in welcoming Captain O' Captain Randy Hutton. <laughs> You didn't tell them about my book. Yeah. Did you not have a book you can buy autographed copies yeah, of the gift shop? Oh, you're going to cover it later. Really? Did you autograph it? <laughs> okay, uh, who saw the uh, Ken Burns Vietnam series that was on last, last fall? And about that time, uh, there was a lot of interest in this, and there was an opening in January, and uh, uh, I said, maybe people would like to hear about uh, what the Navy did for uh, anti-shipping introduction uh, during the, uh, the Vietnam War. So we decided to do that. And they asked me to personalize it. Don't just give us a history like I could read in any book, but, but put myself into the story on on what was going on and where I was going and, and how all of this came apart. So uh, I hope you don't think I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> putting too much of myself in here, but uh, it's part of the story. Uh, my experience flying in the Navy was a fantastic adventure. Uh, as a five-year-old kid, I was fascinated with flying. I built the airplanes, I read the flying books, uh, I visited the airport as much as I could. and, and I. Watched Victory at Sea. It was one of my favorite series. I would skip going out to dinner with the family so I could stay home and watch Victory at Sea. And I, I thought about flying in the military, but I never pursued it, partly because I had no idea how you went about becoming a military pilot. However, world and national events in the mid-60s would change that. And that, this is an introduction to the personalized story of my flying in Vietnam. I've read a lot on the war there and how we got involved, how we fought the war in the aftermath. And when reading these books, dates will pop up when something took place. And I can place myself at that time where I was when this event was taking place and how these unimportant events around the world started to creep into your life as an awareness of what was going on. So I've kind of used these dates and photos to interlink what was going on here, particularly in light of being a draft age man about to graduate from college. There's a personal story embedded here in a bigger picture of the ongoing operation known as Market Time. Uh, I'm getting insight from the lower level of the squadron as a junior officer in the squadron, what I saw, what I did, uh, and these are things beyond anything you'll ever find in an official publication of what went on during Market Time. There was no great danger in these patrols we flew. They were not much different than patrols we'd fly in other parts of the world. We never were exposed to hostile fire. In fact, the P-3 operated with what they called with permission. If there was somebody who was going to shoot at you, you did not go there because we burned profusely when shot at because we were just a big flying gas tank. <laughs> we had restrict standoff rules of no more than a thousand yards from any ship that might look hostile. And I flew out of, when my time in Vietnam, I flew out of a base that was an in-country R&R center. So that was my exposure to the uh, conflict in Vietnam. So I make no claims of personal heroics about my time in, in market time, but we were in direct combat support, and we did fly our butts off. Uh, that was the most flying I've ever done in my life. In six months of being over there, I got almost 700 hours of flight time, and the only thing we did was fly. There was no office duties, no inspections coming up. We just flew and drank. <laughs> <laughs> I consider myself truly lucky to have been able to serve my country as a pilot in the Navy, and this is a story. 
In February of 1965, President Johnson sent the Marines into Da Nang. The North Vietnamese responded almost immediately by sending three trawlers to land just south of Da Nang. Two were intercepted, one escaped, one was destroyed, and one was uh, captured after it offloaded about half its supplies. The North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong needed supplies. To move stuff from Hanoi down the Ho Chi Minh Trail took about 170 days. If they could land one of these trawlers, they could support a battalion for 90 days and they could get it down there in seven days. So seaborne supply was a mode of operation for the Vietnamese, uh, North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. So on the 11th of March, the decision made by the Coast Guard to start these anti-penetrations operations, and it would be known as market time. And the coast was broken into various sectors. And to make these memorable, their call signs were all beers. <laughs> Phil, you remember that calling up Perky Beer and Falstaff and uh, the various guys over there? Yeah. And you can see right here they got an inner sec uh, uh, coastal area, then they've got an outer area, and they had different ships that patrolled these various areas. In close to the shore, they'd have these Swiss boats. There were 54,000 fishing boats off the coast of South Vietnam. They didn't go very far out to sea, about 12 miles is about as far as they went out. But it's expected that a lot of small interdiction was done by fishing boats sneaking across the DMZ and rendezvousing with the uh, patriots from the Viet Cong to get supplies in. And these boats were supposed to look for them. As they went out further, they've got these World War II minesweepers that were a little bigger, had a little more ability to stay at sea to uh, intercept the larger trawlers. And then out at about 70 miles, they had these escort picket ships. A lot of these were the World War II destroyers that had been converted to radar picket ships during the Cold War. And this is one we were flying by right here out there about 50 miles off the coast. But VP airplanes were the most essential part of the market time operation. In order to do this, they set up a coordinated long-range patrol for broad reconnaissance shipping tracking. And they did this with the P-2 and the P-5 patrol airplane. In fact, this was the last operational use of the P-5, uh, which is the flying boat you see right there. They flew their last mission, I think, uh, in 1967. And then the P-2s were phased out by 1969. And they, because the P-2 and the P-5 were fairly slow airplanes, they flew them out of a number of different bases to cover different sectors of the coast. But in 1965, they started using the P-3 Orion. The P-3 had just been introduced to the Pacific Coast. It was the newest airplane in the Navy's inventory. And the P-3 could cruise at 300 knots. It had a 400 knot dash speed. It could stay in the air 20 hours unrefueled if necessary with a 5,000 mile range. And what we did to accomplish this, we shut off our number one engine when we got on station. And this reduced the fuel burn by about 20%. But even on three engines, we could still do 365 knots. We could cover a lot of area in the P-3 Orion. And this is how they set it up. They had Sangley Point over in the Philippines, and a P-2 would come out of there and cover this sector. Then they had a P-5 coming out of here, we're doing the middle, another P-5 out of Cameron Bay, and a P-2 out of down here at Saigon. And they all flew whoop, independent patrol sectors. And this caused all kinds of problems. The airplanes were so different, and there was no coordination on when the coverage was going, and it, they weren't getting the coverage they wanted. And if you look at what you had to do to cover that patrol area, you had to go up here and over here, down here, down here, and you sometimes had to go 300 knots to stay on your progression down that, that track. And they found out a P-3 could cover twice the area of a P-2 or a P-5. One P-3 could do the work of those two airplanes. So the P-3 became the airplane that they wanted to fly the market time missions with. And in 1966, there were only three P-3 squadrons in the Pacific Fleet 
operational, ready to deploy. The P-3 had been introduced on the East Coast in 1962, but they delayed about two and a half to three years before they brought it to the Pacific Fleet, so there weren't enough squadrons to cover market time, so they started tasking East Coast squadrons to augment the Pacific Fleet. And my squadron, VP-45, was based at Jacksonville, Florida, and we went over to the Western Pacific in the Southeast Asia Theater to augment the Pacific Fleet. And uh, we were the last uh, squadron to do that. By the end of 69, they had enough P-3 squadrons in the Pacific Fleet, they didn't need the East Coast squadrons to come over. And what they decided to do, because of the P-3 capabilities, they were going to run a constant barrier from a 20 miles to 120 miles off the coast, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, radar coverage of that area. And the mission was to search, locate, identify all contacts. Uh, you can kind of see, this is the way the Navy always flew patrols and patrol airplanes. You went to a sector, you found everything, you logged what you saw, you filled out a rig log, you took a photograph of it, and you turned it into naval intelligence. And later on they found out there were not many Texaco tankers beaching themselves to resupply South Vietnam. It was the small targets that were really what we should have been looking for. But they called these daisy chain operations. And this is what it looked like. Uh, the yellow flights came out of Cameron Bay, the blue flights came out of Utapau, Thailand, and that's where we were based out of for our rotations on market time. And you can see we covered 24 hours a day. And we had what they called soft time. You know, the military always say, we want to be on target at 0102.3. Well, we didn't do that. We were on target one hour before or one hour after. We had two hours to show up where we're supposed to show up. And they did that intentionally so that the bad guys couldn't say, oh, they always come by here at 5 o'clock, we can make a run at 5.30 because we might come by at 5, we might come by at 7. And these, uh, these were uh, 10 to 12-hour uh, flights. Uh, our skipper uh, wanted us to get the 12-hour flights anytime possible. He wanted to set a record for flight hours on market time. And you can see right here, this is what we called position of intended movement. That was the first hour, second hour, third hour, fourth hour, fifth hour, sixth, seventh hour. But we could be two hours late down here. We could do a nine-hour patrol as long as we didn't get outside that protected box. And these were run as normal open ocean patrols uh, in the 60s before we had satellite and uh, all of the other coverages. Uh, every once in a while they'd assign us a sector of the ocean and we'd go find all the boats in the ocean and log what they were and take pictures of them. So they kind of approached this market time patrol the same way as they did an open ocean patrol. We were looking for ship count. Kind of like they looked for body count, they wanted us to get ship count. And so what you do, you come out of Utapau about 1900 and ahead of you there were two other airplanes already in patrol. This guy was in the 2100 box, this guy was the 2100 box. And we would show up here just off the name. We'd go about 50 miles north of Dang, about 50 miles off the coast. And that's where we would start our patrols coming down here. So what you had is you had these constantly moving boxes. So that there was always no more than five hours and no less than three hours coverage of every piece of the ocean there. Okay, so meanwhile, back in the States, how did I end up as a navigator on Crew 20 of Patrol Squadron 45? Uh, Michigan State University, the fall of 1964. Uh, I remember that uh, the Gulf of Tonkin incident took place that summer. It was kind of a hot topic of talking around the dorm and, uh, and the parties, uh, what the hell's going on over there. And then... Uh, President Johnson presented himself as the peace candidate, and in October he made a statement, uh, we're not about to send any American boys to fight nine or 10,000 miles away from home to do something that the Asian boys ought to be doing for themselves. 
It's funny because President Roosevelt in 1940 made almost the same statement. He said, I will not send any American boys to fight in any foreign wars. Well, when the Japs attacked, this was no longer a foreign war, it was an American war. So he sent everybody overseas. And I started reading the papers, and uh, they started to build up for Vietnam, and I read that they were going to crank up recruiting of pilots for the reserves. When you need to build up your pilot force, you can't wait four years for a guy to graduate from the academy or finish his ROTC. You go to the civilian college graduate and you get them to join the reserves because that's the quickest way to get somebody into the aviation training program. And I was sitting in the student union up there and I picked up the student newspaper and it said there, uh, Navy aviation recruiter will be on campus today in the Union Hall 7 at like from 1 to 5. So I showed up about 1 o'clock and I said, I want to be a Navy pilot. And he says, well, good. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about it. I said, no, you don't tell me anything. I want to be a Navy pilot. I want to go to the next step. He said, well, you have to take some written tests. And I said, well, let's do it. So I took the written test and he said, well, you did pretty good. Uh, let's set up an appointment to go down to Gross Seal and, uh, and get your physical and, and find out uh, uh, what you're going to do. And I, shortly after this, I was walking down the sidewalk in East Lansing. And I looked in the window of this drugstore and I saw this book called Goodbye to Some, written by Gordon Forbes. Gordon Forbes was a VP pilot who flew four-engine land-based airplanes out of the Philippines to interdict shipping from the Japanese along the coast of Vietnam. And I read that book, the characters in it stuck to me, and I decided I wanted to be a VP pilot. I thought what they did was really cool, and that's what I was going to chase down. And there's so many parallels in the book to what I experienced that it's almost one of those deja vu things. Why did I pick that book up? What incident made me pick that up? Like right here. This he talks about using this as a as a rendezvous point for doing the coasting. This is a prison on uh, Pudu Kantar Island. And we'd always run up in there. And the buildings were still bombed out from World War II by the Americans. And uh, it was just kind of an abandoned island. But I remember reading about that, and I remember that we used to fly by there all the time. I hadn't flown, so I thought, if I'm going to go in and fly, I should find out if I can fly. <laughs> so I started taking lessons here at Bull Run Airport. And I soloed here in uh, May of 1965. Uh, and you can see me right there with my uh, the airplane and my instructor. My instructor was a guy named... Uh, Fire Can Haddock, a Zantop pilot, World War II P-47 pilot, uh, who always had a cigar in his mouth. And, and he, he, he was kind of a, it was a, he was a great pilot, great instructor. Uh, but his, some of his training things were, if you ever do that again, you might friggin' kill yourself. Pay attention. <laughs> well, when I told the Navy recruiter I was taking flying lessons, he said, stop you'll pick up a lot of bad habits. Uh, they won't do you any good to uh, have your private license. So in the summer of 65, I, I, quit, uh, I quit flying. And getting pilots into combat operational units is a long process. It's almost two and a half years from the time you recruit a guy till he flies an operational mission in a combat airplane. So they started building up that fiscal year 68, which is October of 67 uh, till September of 68, the Navy said they trained 3,500 pilots for the Marine Corps, Navy, Coast Guard, NOAA. And that was the largest training class since World War II. And I was right in the home of those guys. Of course, I went down here to Gros Seal and I swore in October 27th, 1965, and for those of you who've been in the military, that is a day you never forget because that's when your pay raises take place. <laughs> and one of the advantages we had as reservists, that started our military commitment. And even though I'd only been on active duty,
for less than a year, I got my first pay raise where the academy and ROTC guys had to wait for two full years to get their raises. So I showed them my paycheck and said, that. now what about that school you went to? How, how's that helping you out on? <laughs> but then I went down to this uh, wonderful place called AOCS in Pensacola, Florida. And nobody told me anything about what this was going to be like. In fact, the recruiter said, hey, the beaches down there are great. You're going to love Pensacola. Take your tennis racket, your golf clubs. Uh, you're really going to enjoy Pensacola. So I show up on the base there, and I'm a day late. Gross Seal got the date mixed up. And everybody's snickering when they look at my orders. And there are three of us from Gross Seal. And we showed up to the front door of this building. This is the old... Uh, It was the World War II barracks. They called it Poopyville, because you put on this green bag and you wore it for like 10 straight days. <laughs> and uh, I walked in that room, and this guy stuck his head out of a little hole, and I said, hi, Sarge. <laughs> and he came out there screaming at me, get the freak off my quarter deck. What the hell is a quarter deck? <laughs> it must be this 25% of the floor. We'll all move over here. He starts screaming, pointing down the hallway, and it was all downhill from there. Uh, that's my class. There were 32 of us. Uh, and th the day before we graduated, we finished our Oscar candidate duties, and we went into the auditorium there, and, and the class captain came up, and, and he said, we're going to get real serious now. The fun and games are over. I, I think every one of us, you call the last 13 weeks here fun and games? He said, you're going to go in and you're going to start training to, to fly in combat. And in five years, one out of three in this class will either be dead, MIA, POW, or have dropped from this program. That's pretty serious stuff. I feel real bad about those two guys on the side of me. And it was true. But we only had... Uh, one guy in my class killed, and uh, we had a lot of DORs. DOR is drop-on request, and they were draft dodgers. You couldn't get into OCS. OCS was backed up, so they found out they could get into the aviation program, and if once they got their commission, they could drop out of the program and then just finish up their, uh, their three years as an officer uh, at some station. I went out to uh, Softly Field just north of Pensacola, where I, I got to fly the T-34, and uh, we got uh, 25 hours in the T-34, and, and this is the PR photo. This is kind of a, a funny thing. They've got this pull-down curtain with a picture of a T-34, and it's painted <laughs> yellow. It's not even the orange and white like the real ones. And this helmet is on a pole, and they give you the helmet, and you've taped your name across the bottom of the helmet outside the picture, and... This was a half a flight suit, top only. <laughs> and the parachute harness was just a strap you put across your shoulder. They could photograph my class in about 15 minutes. <laughs> so I finished up there soloed, and I, I, was, I was walking out to the airplane one day, and, and uh, my instructor, they give you one instructor, he says, uh, Anson Hutton, have you uh, thought about what you want to fly when you uh, get your wings? And I said, sir, I want to fly P-3s. I want a VFP P pilot. He took the cigar out of his mouth. He says, I'd rather have VD in my health record than VP in my logbook. <laughs> <laughs> How do you really feel about that, sir? He was a good guy. I, I had a lot of fun flying with him. He cut my tie off and all that stuff. Then I went out to Whiting Field, uh, uh, northeast of uh, Pensacola. And I was out there for about six months. And I flew the T-28, I got about 100 hours in the T-28, acrobatic, instruments, formation, cross-country, nighttime, and uh, you really loved that airplane. After you flew it for a while, you really felt good in that airplane. That was, that was a lot of fun. But I've been in the Navy almost a year now, and I've still been flying single-engine airplanes. And then I went back to Softly Field. Uh, in those days, every pilot, no matter what they were going to fly, had the carrier qualified. And we carrier qualified in the uh, T-28. I got about 15 hours. You'd make 100 landings on an aircraft carrier marked out on a land runway with the meatball system. 
until you got the pattern down. <clears throat> and then you went in the ready room every day, and every third day you'd make one landing, and then they'd come in and say, your flight's going now, 30 minutes, man your airplane. And when you go to the aircraft carrier, it's solo. There's no instructors with you, and they tell you the briefing is, fly due south out of here at about 60 miles, you'll pick up the TAC and from the Lexington, flight lead at 25 miles, tell them you're Charlie 2 flight, and follow their instructions. Eight landings, and uh, then they took the airplane away from me. And uh, <laughs> that's a picture of me right after my, uh, my carrier landings. Uh, you, you feel pretty good, you think you really mastered it by that time. Then I went down to Corpus Christi, Texas, and I spent about six months flying the uh, TS-2A. I got about 125 hours in this, again, multi-engine training, instruments, cross-country formation. And in February of 68, I received orders to Patrol Squadron 45. And I didn't know they were going to Vietnam at that time. It was an East Coast squadron. But when I checked in with the squadron to find out what was going on, where they're going to deploy, they said, oh, this is really good. We're, we're going to uh, Vietnam. We're going to fly patrols in Vietnam. And when they did that, they beefed up the squadron manning level. When you're flying patrols on the East Coast, they're kind of a peacetime routine. When you went to Vietnam, they put three extra crews in the airplane because you're going to fly so many hours. And they also wanted redundancy in case there was any combat losses. They still had crews to fly the airplanes. After I got my wings in March of 68, I had to go to navigator training in the Navy. Uh, in the 60s, all patrol plane pilots had to qualify as navigators using the sun and the stars and the moon and pressure patterns and all that stuff in order to fly as a pilot on the P-3s. So you can see the guy there looking through that periscope sextant going, where the hell am I? <laughs> uh, that was followed by going down to the uh, fleet training unit, ASW Tactics and Weapons at Norfolk, Virginia for two months. Learned all about the weapons and the torpedoes and how you load them, deploy them, sign of boys, submarine tracking. Then I went to the Patuxent River, Maryland for about three months, and this is where I learned to fly the P-3. And then because I was going to a combat area, as soon as I finished that, I went to a SEER school in Rangeley, Maine. And uh, it's out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, it's an interesting experience. And, and the one thing I learned mostly in that school is when you, not ha you have not slept or eaten in three days, you are not the person you were three days ago. Your ability to resist, your ability to do anything, it's amazing how weak you get when you don't eat. And I think that was the biggest experience I got out of there. Uh, besides all the psychological tricks they played on you to try to get you to, to break down and give secrets, etc. So I reported to Jacksonville in October of 1968, and they were scheduled to go to Southeast Asia end of November, early December. And this is my crew. Crew 20, Detachment 2, Patrol Squadron 45. Because I was on the EXO's crew, I was supposed to have four pilots on the crew. Because the XO had so many administrative duties, he could not stand alert, and when he flew, he normally wanted to take a break. So we only had three pilots, one of which was the XO, so I flew as co-pilot on the airplane a whole bunch of times more than most navigators, because NFOs, nothing against NFOs guys, uh, were easier to train and get in the pipeline than pilots, so they were filling the navigator position with NFOs. So our crew had two NFOs and two and a half pilots with the XO on it. So where are you? Are you PG2P? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm right here. PP3P. Now, <laughs> there's the co pilot, and there's the XO squadron. Uh, he was a really good guy. I really enjoyed working with him. He was a good mentor. I learned a lot from him. And this is the layout of the airplane. Uh, the front end of the airplane, you've got 
The BPC normally would be in the left seat, the co-pilot in the right seat. But in the Navy, we never made takeoffs and landings from anywhere except the left seat until we became an instructor pilot. So from my first time I flew the P-3 until I became an instructor about three years later, it was always left seat. Flight engineer sat in the middle, radio operator back here. Uh, we carried a second mechanic for long trips so the, the flight engineer could get out of the seat. And he kind of had a rest station right here. Uh, this is the head. And if you ever heard about Senator Proxmire and the $594 toilet seat cover, that was in that head right there. <laughs> Uh, back here we called it the tube. We had the radar, ECM, navigator, TACO, uh, sonar operator. We carried an in-flight tech to work on the equipment. Ordnance was back here and uh, the navigator sat back here. This is the flight station of the P-3. Uh, the engineer sat facing forward between the two seats. So you had direct eye contact with him. He was an extra set of eyes in the cockpit to look out the window. And this was taken in the uh, airplane that's out at Selfridge. Uh, we, uh, my reserve squadron has preserved a P-3 Orion at Selfridge, and it's open uh, every weekend from April through October. If you want to go see a real P-3, it's well preserved. You'll see pictures of it here shortly. <coughs> this was the flight engineer's panel. It was overhead, so it was right there that everybody could see the panel. You didn't have to turn over your shoulder and try to look back at it. Everything was right up there. And one of the common things I get when giving tours in the P3, uh, P3 out of Selfridge is, how do you figure out all those switches and everything that goes on up there? Well, this for an antique airplane was extremely well organized. There's an electrical panel, air conditioning, pressurization, engine RPM, engine start, pneumatic wing, pneumatic engine. It was all clustered, made it very easy to keep track of what was going on. Radio operator sat behind the pilot. Uh, he was an expert in uh, flashing light Morse code, because uh, we used that to try to communicate with Navy vessels that wouldn't answer their radios. And it didn't work very well either. Uh, this was the uh, bathroom on there. Uh, there was no flushing toilet. There was a bucket with a seat on it. And the, uh, the kind of the rule was, if you used the bucket, you cleaned it. I don't care if you were the XO or the most junior ordinance man on the crew. You used it. You cleaned it. So there was a lot of waiting and holding for this 14-hour flight until the first guy used it. And some of the food we'd get to eat in Thailand and Vietnam, it was impossible to go that long without using it. <laughs> uh, this is the uh, APS-80 radar, which in the early 60s was the most advanced radar out there. Very, very capable radar. We could pick up a rowboat in six-foot seas at 25 miles. We could pick up a 100-foot steel trawler at about 50 miles from about 3,500 feet. And this guy's name was Soupy Campbell. And why we call him Soupy is he was a short order cook before he came in the Navy and he loved cooking. So we had unbelievable meals on these patrols. Uh, he'd go over to the, uh, to the Air Force Chow Hall and he told them uh, we were doing the daily VIP shuttle flight back to the Philippines to take the Admiral back over after he'd been over there in Thailand and we needed the shrimp. We needed the fresh corn, we needed the steaks, and they gave us as much as we wanted. There was so much food left over after these missions that we'd have barbecues on our days off with this food. He was still up at Whitby Island, by the way. Huh? He was in 47, he's up at, he's up at Whitby Island, the last I heard. Yeah, he made warrant officer and became a taco yep. on uh, P3 Charlie updates. We stayed in touch. I lost talk with him about 10 years ago when we moved. But there he is in the galley with his uh, chef's hat on. I mean, you fly the log and you come up and he'd take your order. What would you like for breakfast, Mr. Hotton? Uh, how about two eggs, scrambled bacon, and French toast? Okay, how many pieces of French toast? I'll make it four. Uh, this was the ECM operator, uh, Julie operator. We didn't do much Julie patrolling off the coast, but he could run the ECM and watch other radars shine on us to get an idea of uh, who was looking at us. Uh, this is the TACO station right here. Uh, this is the 
Second tackle who was doing a navigator job. Uh, this is a picture of me down there doing my navigator job when he wasn't back there. And uh, this was the senior tackle on the airplane. Uh, again, this is out of our Selfridge Bird. We never had anything this sophisticated back in the mid-60s. We had almost World War II stuff on the airplane in the 60s. Uh, we had no reason to carry ASW stores on the airplane. But one of the things our skipper wanted to do, he wanted to be capable of responding to anything that happened while we were in the sky. So we carried what they called a complete Charlie load of sauna boys. 64 of these sauna boys. It added about 3,500 pounds to the weight of the airplane to carry these sauna boys around, which made the airplane heavy all the time. Uh, this is the uh, crew rest area. We see the bunk beds back here, and back here there's a there's a kitchen, a uh, convection oven, didn't have microwaves back then, refrigerator, coffee pot, frying pan, and that's where the cook would do his work. So in December 1968, we left Jacksonville, spent the night in Moffett, spent the night in Barbers Point, Guam, and then into the Philippines. Four days to transit the Pacific, pretty easy transit except for that second day, which was about 12 hours. And we operated out of three bases. Our primary base was Sangley Point in the Philippines, and that's where our admin and maintenance was. And then we had detachments at Cameron Bay and detachments at Utapau, Utapau being our primary base. Sangley Point was a little strip right here in Manila Bay. There's downtown Manila. And right over here, off the end of the runway, you can see in this picture right here, is the island of Corregidor. So whenever we flew out of there, we always flew over Corregidor, and you could, you could look down and still see the fortifications, the gun emplacements uh, from World War II. Oh, unless that picture didn't come through. Uh, that's the transportation in downtown Cavite City. Those guys sat out the gates like taxi cab guys, and you never got in one of those by yourself, because they might not go where you wanted to go. They'd go someplace you didn't want to be, and then it'd be four times as much to go where you wanted to go. <laughs> so you never went alone in those things. I, I had one of those adventurous rides, and uh, that was uh, not much fun. This is, uh, we had 100% maintenance availability. And this is one of the things when you're flying in a combat area, you have all the support you want. And I just come out of flight training, I went to this squadron, and you could write up that one of the light bulbs was burned out on the face of the Doppler readout, and they'd give you a new Doppler. They wouldn't change the light bulb, they'd give you a new Doppler. I mean, so you wrote something up, you wrote up an engine that had a little fluctuation in it, they sent you a brand new engine and prop combination, so in four hours that airplane would be back in service. We got a record High maintenance availability, we flew 330 successful missions with only four aborts. This was a record for market time operations. How was this done? Does anyone understand the term in hack? Okay. In hack is an unofficial Navy punishment. It doesn't officially go in your record, it's not mentioned in your fitness reports, but I don't like what you did. You're confined to your room except for meals and flying for two weeks. I catch you outside your room at the bar, the club, the golf course. I'm going to take administrative action against you. In Utapau, in December, one of our patrol plane commanders aborted a mission for mechanical generator failure. And right there in the manual, when this red light came on for mechanical generator failure, it was returned to base and abort. So he returned to base and aborted. The CO said, this airplane flies better on three engines than most airplanes fly on four. In the future, you'll just shut down that engine and you'll continue on your mission. <coughs> Amongst the, uh, we called it the J.O. Protection Society, we set up this thing. The only legitimate abort criteria in VP-45 was an uncontained wing fire inboard of the outboard engine. Uh, we, had, we had two more aborts the next five months, and they were for legitimate things like a bus B failure 
which is everything in the back of the airplane so nothing worked. You couldn't do any of your jobs. Our skipper was a World War II Dauntless Dive Bomber tail gunner. And things were pretty loose in World War II. I mean, if the engine started, you went. <laughs> so he kind of brought that same philosophy in his leadership stance on the P-3. If your engine started, you went. And Utapau is where we did most of our flying. Uh, I don't know if these pictures see it right here. This is the B-52 ramp. The B-52s that flew over Vietnam came off of here. The KC-135s were right here on this side of the ramp. And down here by the ocean was the Navy's P-3 ramp. Uh, you can see the Navy ramp right there. And right here is our maintenance facility. You'll see that in the next picture. Uh, this was our briefing room inside this building right here. And there's a little sign showing that we're the Commander Naval Air Forces uh, Thailand. Uh, we didn't have much intelligence. The briefings were, you know, the escape code of the day, um, which snake, if it bit you, would, you'd die the quickest by, uh, a few code word passwords. The briefing was, there's not much. We're just going to take off and fly our mission. Right here, this is the maintenance facility. All of these old beat up trailers. That was a standard Navy maintenance. And you can't see the picture very good here, but there's this 1955 Volkswagen van that they painted camouflage on and put our squadron logo on it. And that's the one that ran back and forth between the, the maintenance buildings and the ramp where the airplanes were being uh, serviced. Uh, there's one of our, our big, ugly uh, neighbors. And this nose number is 678. Who knows what the number on our B-52 is? 677. One number apart from the one we have out here in the air park. Uh, they also had these airplanes there. They were, they were repaving the runway up at uh, Uban. And these airplanes were this EC-121s. And they dropped land sonoboys. These were radio receivers that they'd fall in the jungle. And then this airplane would orbit and listen for trucks, chatter, bicycle noises to identify targets that the airplanes could go in and try to bomb on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This was our, uh, our, our barracks right here, a three-story concrete building, six to a room, and uh, this is our, our bunker. In case we got mortared or something, we could go in that bunker. Uh, it, it's a funny thing. Uh, there was a radio personality in Hanoi called Hanoi Hannah. And we listened to her because she played popular U.S. music, the latest rock and roll songs uh, interspersed with propaganda. And she welcomed our squadron to Thailand and said that the mortar operators had pretty well zeroed in on our ramp and our BOQ, and they were probably going to execute sometime in the next two nights a very coordinated attack against those two facilities. Well, that's interesting. How the hell did she know we were in Utapau, Thailand? But we listened to her because they played the good music. Uh, we had a club inside the, uh, the BOQ. Uh, it cost you a dollar to join. Shots were a quarter. Beers were 20 cents. And pop was 15 cents. But you could go to the Air Force Club during happy hour, which was like from 3 to midnight. And you could buy beers for a dime. <laughs> <laughs> Cameron Bay. Uh, in uh, April of uh, 1969, the North Koreans shot down an EC-121 off the coast of North Korea. Uh, they moved aircraft carriers north, and they moved the patrol squadron that was flying patrols out of Cameron Bay up to Okinawa and Korea as a counter to the uh, North Koreans. So VP-45 picked up the detachment rotation out of Cameron Bay. So VP-45 was flying five trips a day uh, in support of market time. Uh, that's a picture of the runway coming in there to uh, uh, Cameron Bay. Uh, big, long Air Force type runway. No problem operating off that. And again, you notice 
the maintenance facilities over there are the house trailers. And I don't know if they emptied those or if they put them on the 141s and flew them back to the States and hit them someplace. But uh, that was our, our thing. The beaches at Cameron Bay were just gorgeous. The water was crystal clear down to about 20 feet. The sand was pure white, fine, no rocks in it. And it was really a beautiful facility. And I said, you know, when the war's over, the Hilton will probably build a hotel here because it's just gorgeous. Uh, again, that's the beach down there by the, uh, by the ocean. You see how nice it looks. Uh, that going to those machine gun emplacements there on the, on the beach. It might have been left by the French or the Japanese. I have no idea. But it was recognized that these air patrols could not identify contacts at night. So that the barrier that we had set up could be penetrated by an informed infiltrator. So we had these paraflyers for nighttime identification. And they were not very effective. For one thing, once you dropped the paraflyer, you were no longer hiding in the sky. Everybody in the world see it. So what you do is you fly by one side of the ship, drop the paraflyer, go behind the ship, and get on the other side so you can look through the ship into the paraflyer to try to identify the, uh, the ship you had dropped the paraflyer on. And sometimes you'd have a radar contact, you drop the paraflyer, but you couldn't see the ship because you had five or six foot seas and it was a small 10 or 12 foot boat that just hid in the valleys of the, uh, the waves. Uh, we also qualified to carry the, uh, the AGM-9 bullpup. Uh, this was a remote uh, controlled guided missile. It was designed for the attack guys in the A-4s and the F-4s, but nobody liked it because once you launched it, you had to stay between where the missile was and the target so you could steer it with the remote control, which meant you couldn't do any dodging of flak or missiles so the attack guys didn't like it, so they gave it to the VP guys. Uh, and we never flew with these. We trained in them. We had them on, in the uh, storage area, but we never flew with these because they didn't want us to shoot anything uh, and uh, possibly cause an international incident. When you went over to Utapau, you went for a typical nine-day rotation and you'd come, you'd fly from Sangley, do a market time patrol, recover in Utapau. Then you'd stand alert for 24 hours to back up the other crew. You'd go into rest, you'd pick up a night flight. Then you'd pick up a day flight. And then you'd go back into alert, pick up a day flight, and go back to the Philippines. When you fly every other day, a night patrol, and then a day patrol, you are always exhausted. And uh, we asked the wing, why don't we do a month of nights and a month of days? And the answer was, we want you to be totally experienced to do both missions. Well, what happens when you haven't slept all day and you go out on a 12-hour mission, and when you fly by the, where the Mekong River comes out, that's right in the international shipping lanes going from Singapore up to Hong Kong and Japan. It's busy as I-94 at rush hour. And you fly through there, and you're just logging positions and ships. And then you turn around the south part of Vietnam, and there's nothing. It's dead silent. It's pitch black. Nobody's talking to you. And your eyelids start to get heavy. You're at 1,500 feet on the autopilot, one engine in the bag, and you're not off. Was I down for 30 seconds or 30 minutes? But you're real awake when you wake up again. <laughs> and I was in the right seat. And I look across the cockpit, and the guy in the left seat was like, <laughs> and the engineer was leaning forward with the straps like this. And I leaned and looked down the tube, and there wasn't a wake soul on the airplane. <laughs> so I'm going, uh, how do I? wake people up without waking them up. <laughs> so I said, oh, I got it. So I got on the PA and, hey, I went, galley flight, galley flight, how about some coffee for the cockpit? And the other two guys woke up, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll have one too. Bring me, bring me. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> we stay awake for about another 45 minutes and then you were just so dog tired at the end of those night patrols that uh, you were 
we were almost in a zombie state. Uh, this is my log book for the month of March 69. Uh, I flew 106 hours as a pilot and 22 hours as a navigator. So that was a 130 hour month just about. And if you look at it, I only got four landings that, mu that month. Because when you fly a 12 hour patrol, there's only one landing. If you've got three pilots in the airplanes, that means every fourth patrol is your chance to get your landing. Uh, this is the sun coming up after an all-nighter going into, uh, into Utapau. Uh, just dog-tired. Uh, there's a guy in the other seat going into Utapau. On return from Sangley, we would uh, do open ocean patrols. We wouldn't fly a, a market time mission out of Utapau to Sangley. They'd send us down here to do the shipping lanes going up here. They'd send us across here to look at the shipping lanes up here and, uh, and go back into the... Uh, the Philippines. Now while I was over there, Cambodia was a neutral country. And they opened their country to the communists. The Viet Cong and the NVA could offload their supplies about 12 feet across the Vietnamese-Cambodian border to supply all the operations in three and four corps inside the South Vietnamese area. We were given explicit instructions not to interfere with what they were doing because Cambodia was a neutral country and what they did was their own business. Our CO found a Russian ship in there and he wanted to get photos of it. So he went in there and rigged it, photographed it, and when he turned in the intelligence report, the wings chewed his ass out for not obeying orders of staying out of a neutral country's business on what they were doing. And it wasn't until two years later, when Nixon was trying to withdraw from Vietnam, that he used the B-52 to destroy all the supplies that had been sent into Cambodia. Of course, by that time, it was, it was politically incorrect to use bombers. But this is the time that we were flying our patrols. There was no reason for the communists to try to penetrate our patrol barrier because they could just sail around the end, go into Cambodia, offload their supplies, no danger of being in trouble. And, uh, but in the summer of 1969, Sinukville was closed. So the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese had to get their supplies down to the south. So they started their penetration operations again. And when we were flying these patrols, they were what called overt patrols. Find, identify every target, just like the old open ocean patrols. They wanted us to rig every ship, but the North Vietnamese, if they were discovered, they just make a 180 and go back out to sea because they had not penetrated the 12 mile coastal barrier. We could not touch them. And there was a elite group inside North Vietnam called the 125 group. And they had explicitly trained crews. The secrecy of these operations was some of the highest in the North Vietnamese military. They had Russian ECM on these ships. They could plot our P3s because of our distinctive radar and get timing of our passage and stuff so they could penetrate the barrier to get in near the beach. And one of the things going on in Vietnam was the Air Force was photographing the harbors in North Vietnam daily. And they'd see these resupply trawlers leave port. They'd have a photograph on Thursday, it was in port. On Friday, it wasn't in port. And they passed that back to the Air Force to Washington. They never passed it to the Navy in Vietnam to say that one of these supply ships may have pulled out of port to try to make a run. So we didn't have any intelligence on when they were coming out. We could not board and search boats until they were within 12 miles of the coast. Well, if you're going to board them with a boat off your destroyer, they've got maybe 15, 20, 30 minutes to throw all the crap on the boat in the ocean so they don't get caught with contraband. So the rules of engagement were very restrictive on what we could do to potential enemies bringing in supplies. And the biggest area, because 
The Ho Chi Minh Trail could supply down here, but down here was another, almost the same walk from Hanoi down there into the south area. And this is the high penetration areas where they found the supplies coming in. And there wasn't much patrolling on the south. So they did an exercise. They took the uh, minesweepers and they sent them out to mimic, mimic the uh, North Vietnamese supply ships. And they found that 50% of them could penetrate our barrier. So they changed what we're doing. We went to a new one. This is after I left. This is how they modified market time afterwards. They went to covert, find, track, do not identify, pass the ship along to somebody else that they can track them. And we stopped looking at XO, SO tankers. There was no problem with that. We started looking for the small ships like you see there. And this is where the guns and the supplies were coming on these small ships. So by 1969, there was a clear picture of what we could expect to penetrate. And we started getting intelligence on the 125 group movements. So they shifted the barriers. They went out with these barrier patrols out here that went out much, much deeper, 20 mile spacing, so you could pick up the small boats. And they also did it along the south coast of Vietnam. And in the first month of operation, they picked up three penetrators. So it started to work quite good. So what the uh, 125 group did is, now they went around through the straits here north of Hanai Island, and they came down the coast of the Philippines through the shallow water here to try to come down in here. We were patrolling there, so they moved the patrols out even further into these areas. So there was never a time that they could penetrate something and not be observed. We even had nuclear submarines in the Gulf of Tonkin. They would pick these ships up and then track them. And they'd pass the information along the P-3s because when they went into the shallow waters off the Philippines, the submarines couldn't go there. So the P-3 would overtly track it till it got the deep water. Then the submarine would track it till it got inside the 100-mile zone. And they now had the authority to sink on spot. No questions asked. We followed you all the way from the harbor in North Vietnam or China. And that pretty well slowed down the penetrations. Uh, they were used over market time until 1972. Uh, they were still flying them. At the height of the uh, offense in 1972, uh, there were 20 patrols a day across the South China Sea. And by September 72, they were down to four flights a day. In January, when they signed the peace agreement, the P-3s had flown their last missions. The Vietnamese wanted the P-3s turned over to them for their patrol duties, but uh, the U.S. Navy said, no, uh, we need the P-3s for the Russian submarines. And although market time uh, received little press coverage, it was one of those things kind of out of sight, out of mind, uh, their importance to preventing these penetrations was really important. The planes could cover large areas in a very, very short time, and they could monitor these suspicious vessels by just lingering in international waters and watching what that ship did. So for 24 hours a day, eight and a half years, they reduced the arms coming down from North Vietnam. And when market time started in 1965, they thought about 19 out of 20 vessels were getting in the south. By 1967, this had been cut from 75 to 10%. During these market time operations, three P-3 crews were lost to combat operations. Uh, 1964, uh, the paraflares were carried inside the airplane. These are titanium flares. And you're supposed to shoot them out the bottom of the airplane through the chute. But the lanyard that ignites it caught on the chute, and it ignited in the airplane. And it was so hot, it burnt the floor out and the hydraulics going to the tail. They lost control of the airplane and lost everybody in the airplane. In February of 68, uh, during the Tet Offensive, uh, VP-26 was lost off the south coast. They checked in on the south coast, but they never made another check-in. They found no wreckage or debris. Uh, they assumed it was hostile action uh, by the enemy. Uh, April 1968, 
VP-26 lost the airplane uh, to a Cambodian gunboat. And they had violated the standoff rules. They came close aboard this uh, Cambodian gunboat, and it opened up with 50 cal tracers and punched uh, holes in the uh, right wing and set the right wing on fire. Uh, my next door neighbor was on this airplane, and it was one of his first missions. And uh, this was a classic case of making bad decisions. Uh, he was going to ditch, but then the airplane was still flying. says, oh, okay, we're going to climb up and bail out. So they climbed up to about 5,000 feet, or he put their parachutes on, and then he picked up an emergency airport on the coast of Vietnam, and he said, uh, I'm going to make it in there and land. Two and a half miles off the beach, the right wing burned off the airplane, the airplane went in the ocean, and everyone was killed. So we came up that if you have a wing fire, you've got five minutes to get out of the airplane. That's all the time you have. And uh, we ran the drills during our NATOPS drills that you had to put the airplane in the water in five minutes. We also stood alert in Sangley Point, and because of the pilot shortage, we stood it with two pilots and two navigators, and we were launched three times on 12 to 14 hour missions with just two pilots on the airplane. And one of them was to cover Yankee Station. This was normally covered by an EC-121, but the runway at Cameron Bay had been uh, blown up by an F-4 with a bad bomb, and the EC-121 couldn't go there, so they launched us. And we flew around the carriers here three or four times in the night to look for possible gunboats coming in there. Uh, that was about a 14-hour mission with two pilots. And because of the, uh, the ability of the uh, P-3 to burn profusely, uh, I didn't like the idea of getting close to anybody that might have guns on, on their boat. It was just one of those things I didn't like. You'd pick up these contacts on radar, and they'd be unlit, unidentified, and you'd do run-ins on them, and you'd do the paraflar thing, drop it, go around the other side, and you'd see these Chinese fishing boats. Or they could have been trawlers, because what the North Vietnamese trawlers did, they'd run up Chinese flags to show that they were not North Vietnamese. We'd plot them and pass those along. Running in on this one particular ship, uh, I thought about my neighbor and, and his uh, demise, and uh, it was a place I, I didn't want to be. It was kind of like, uh, your car breaks down on the expressway in Detroit, and it's two in the morning, and you've got to climb out of your car and walk through some of the neighborhoods to get to a gas station to get some gas for your car. Uh, th that the kind of the feeling that related running in on these gunboats. Uh, we also did uh, ASW patrol. Uh, the USS Enterprise was deploying the Yankee Station, and we were going to do ASW barriers to make sure no Russian ships were passing it. We got out there on station, and uh, they told us uh, the Enterprise is turning around and going home. It had a bomb go off, caught on fire, killed 169 sailors, and uh, five years later, I would be on that aircraft carrier uh, where you could see where the fire was because it was all brand new in that carrier. We also did patrols up towards uh, China, Formosa, uh, Okinawa, just kind of open ocean patrols, just doing, seeing what's out there, uh, and then recovering in places like Tokyo and Atsugi to, uh, to get some R&R. &R. There's uh, yours truly there at the Emperor's <coughs> Temple in Japan. Deployment was over. We set all kinds of records for flight hours, number of missions without an abort, and much like the book that I saw in the drugstore, the P-3 had a max gross takeoff weight of 127,500 pounds. I cannot tell you how many times we operated well over 130,000 pounds because the skipper wanted all the gas you could carry, all the ordnance you could carry, and if you were 133.6, you're going to go anyway. And in this book, the guy talks about making overweight takeoffs, and that was, he described it to a T where you rotate and the airplane does not fly because it's 100 degrees outside with 100% humidity. Uh, you're supposed to get 4,300 horsepower out of your engine. 
you're getting about 3,300 horsepower out of your engine. So it's like taking off on three engines, and it just staggers into the air. In fact, I, I lay there and wake up in the middle of the night with these dreams where I tried to take off, and the airplane would not fly. It crashed. And it's kind of like falling down a staircase. You kind of go, oh, my God. Well, that doesn't happen. <laughs> so we left there, went up to uh, Japan, spent the night. There's Hiroshima. And then the next day, we took off on June 2nd to arrive in Adak, Alaska on the way home on June 1st. And this is where the book comes back. In the book, the guy's done with his patrols, and he's on his way home. And they stop at a Pacific island, and they're going to get some gas and continue their trip. And they crash. Well, that's what happened to me in Adak, Alaska. The wing broke off my airplane on takeoff. Yeah, uh, and we were lightweight, we were 120,000 pounds, we were torque limited, had all the power in the world, and we accelerated like a rocket ship. But the aircraft commander, who'd been a test pilot, wanted to prove that the airplane could abort at any speed. So, at about 130 knots, the smoke hatch in the cockpit blew open. It's designed to open in flight so you can get smoke out and close it again. I had taken my hands off the power levers and put them on the yoke. That means you're going to fly no matter what. Well, he grabs the airplane and says, abort, I've got it. And he throws it on the ground, he throws the engines in reverse. But the flight engineer had left out the circuit breakers that allowed you to go in reverse. Oh, <laughs> and without reverse propellers on this airplane, you cannot stop it. The brakes are for parking it only. So we went off the, the uh, side of the runway, the wing ripped off in a ditch, and the airplane turned into a fireball. And uh, there were 16 of us on the airplane. And one of the things our CO did, we ran a drill, like every month he'd have a surprise drill. He'd tape off an exit, say there's fire out that exit, you can't go out that exit, and we'd do these drills to get off the airplane. And uh, the 16 of us got off, we figured, in about 15 seconds. <laughs> the only guy was hurt, he didn't duck his head going through the exit, and he smacked his forehead on the thing there, and got six stitches across his uh, forehead from uh, smacking the uh, thing there. I bailed out that hatch right there at the top of the ladder. It was about 10 feet off the ground because I was in a big hurry to get out of that airplane. <laughs> no, the ladder was not there. <laughs> and I was 24 years old, but I was in excellent shape. And I'm sprinting away from this airplane, and this really, really old guy, our flight engineer, oldest guy in the crew, he was like 33 and smoked past me. <laughs> There's a picture of my airplane there. Now, this is another strange occurrence. Uh, I built a model of the P-3 that I was going to fly in Vietnam. Same tail numbers, same numbers on it. And as I'm packing up to go overseas, I drop it on the floor. And the right wing breaks off. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like sticking the voodoo doll at the pins. <laughs> and this... Uh, you know, if you've ever been in a situation where you've got a loved one overseas in a combat situation, you think about that person every day, you say prayers, you hope they come home, that, that's just something you think about all the time. And since our next door neighbor had been killed, my wife was really apprehensive about what had happened. And uh, there's kind of a Navy wives club rule. You don't burden your husband overseas with anything that he can't do something about. So your anxieties about maybe you're not coming home or, or the, uh, the car battery went dead, it just, you, you don't put that in, in your correspondence. And it was all letters back then. Uh, in my 11 years active duty, I called home once. It, it was, communication was strictly letters back then. But when my airplane crashed, she got a call. She was eight months pregnant with our son. And the call started, your husband won't be coming home. His airplane crashed in Alaska. <laughs> and she never heard that he's okay. He'll call you in a short time. Uh, and when I called her about four hours later, she was, she was still just broken. And uh, I had to spend 10 days in Alaska to go through the accident investigation, and they blamed it on the flight engineer. <laughs> what happened? Huh? What happened? What? Why? Why? He left the circuit breakers out for the reverse. 
No, why did you have to abort in the first place? Well, he wanted to demonstrate that the airplane could stop even after it got by its V1 rotate speeds because as a test pilot in the Navy, he had done those aborts and he wanted to demonstrate the airplane could operate outside the envelope. And we were parked in ADAC with winds. If the winds are too high, you feather the propellers, but you pull the circuit breakers out not to run the batteries down. Well, the cards that have you take the propellers out of feather don't tell you to reset the breakers, and they're like underneath the flight engineer's seat with a headset over them. I mean, you have to crawl on your hands and knees to find these circuit breakers. And there I am. I'm home. Here's my son and my wife, and uh, we lived happily ever after. <laughs> yes? What happened with the investigation? On the crash? Yes. Uh, they blamed on the flight engineer. And they changed the procedures that they put on the cards. Here's how you put it in, flip it over. When you take it out, reset the breakers. Randy, when, yeah. you're, when you're on patrol and you find uh, uh, illegals doing something, what would you do about that? Well, what we would do is if we had a suspicious ship, we would call one of the beer stations and give them our location, the ship's identity, and then they would vector in one of the PT boats or one of the <coughs> sub-chasers to take a look at the ship, possibly board it to see if there's supplies on it. Way in the back. Yeah, I remember watching the news back in like the mid-60s, and they talked about, they had a piece on about one of the old seaplane tenders that had been dragged out of mothballs and sent to Nam to take care of those Martin flying boats. Uh, I gather it was long gone by the time you were there. Well, they did that. They brought the seaplane tender out. They put them uh, two places in Vietnam, one at Cameron Bay and one up north. I can't remember the name of the place that had a good harbor for the P-5s to fly in and out of. And the, the seaplane tender becomes their home. That's where their, yeah. their beds are, their meals are, their maintenance stories are. Yeah, that was the BP-47. I was in that. And uh, I, I came in just after they got rid of the, uh, the P-5s. And it was the Pine Island. Was the uh, <coughs> was one of them? I think the other one. What's that? I think that's what the what the report on. Yeah, the, uh, the people up front can't hear you. So if you have a question, come on up front and talk on the mic. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, what were you using for navigational aids, say, when you're cruising off the coast? Did you have a ram at the time? Did you? I mean, uh, for I navigation, mean, we had. He asked, "How do we navigate?" Well, when we had the coast in sight, we did radar navigation to pinpoint where we were. When we were outside of land, we had uh, a DR computer that you could put your wind in it. It would take your headings and your true airspeed and, and put a dot on it and you could update it. Uh, we had the RAN in the South China Sea, and uh, for longer missions, we still had Celestial to use. And we had an inertial navigator that was so undependable you couldn't use it. So how could you give your precise lat longitude position, say, to uh, how could you give your um, precise enough lat launch position, say, to uh, of a ship that you saw that you wanted checked out to another ship to check it out? I mean, well, what we did was we had a DR plotter and we'd update our position about every 15 to 20 minutes. And the DR plotter, based on heading and ground speed, would move the buck. So you're always within a mile or two of where you think you are, and you get a readout from the face of the ASA 47 that give you lat long. We also would go over, if we find one of the destroyers, we'd fly over there, mark our wings, and fly towards the target to show where it was. Yes? Maybe everybody knows what that is, but nobody's mentioned it. What is the stinger in the tail for? He wants to know what that long pole is on the back right. of the airplane. Uh, that's how you play lawn darts with this airplane. Uh, it's a magnetic anomaly detector. And what it is, it's a very, very sensitive magnet. It's actually an electron beam going through some kind of gas that picks up variations in the Earth's magnetic field that could be caused by a thousand tons of steel under the water. So when you're hunting for submarines, when you've kind of figured out where they were, you went into what they call man trapping, where you did clover leaves, and when that thing wiggled, you were within a thousand feet of the submarine, and you could deploy a weapon if needed. Thank you. Did I get that right? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
What's that? We were in what called direct con you wonder if we were involved in the war. We were involved in the war in that we were preventing supplies from coming down to the, the bad guys in the south. Uh, we never dropped bombs, we never <coughs> shot rockets, uh, we never went someplace they could shoot at us. Uh, so we were what they called direct combat support. And a funny thing, just before we got over there, they started the daisy, daisy chain. And the rules for getting medals, when you flew across Laos with a combat purpose code in your logbook, you got two points towards an air medal. Okay, so if you did 10 trips, you now got an air medal. And if you did 10 more, you got a bronze star in your air medal. You could just put numbers on it. And uh, we were putting in for like our third air medal the second month we were over there. And, and somebody up at the, uh, the wing went, what the hell is this? E3's getting air medals? Because if you get five air medals, you get a DFC. And we were all going to get our DFCs. And they said, that doesn't count for P3's flying over Laos, even though we're our combat purpose comes. And they took away our air medals that we'd earned already. <laughs> Any other questions? Way, way in the back. Stand up. Stand up. Hang on one second. Oh, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever have an opportunity to fly on a Canadian Argus? No, but I've done exercises with the Argus. I've been on the Argus, talked to the guys, and uh, they're as good as anybody. And they still get to fly them. I'm very jealous of that. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming out. I hope you enjoyed the story. Come out to Selfridge and see our P3.